All right, Barrick and Millie, thanks for taking a few minutes. We're going to be talking about uh, education in the era of coronavirus. Uh, we've got Barrick Abramson and Millie Hamner with us who lead uh, Keystone Policy Center's uh, education program. So Barrick, let me just go ahead and start with you. Uh, so what are some of the issues that educators and administrators have had to face uh, as they've been dealing with uh, coronavirus? Sure, and, and it's a long list. And I think on the surface has been the most tectonic shift in K-12 education of the last century. We asked educators and school system leaders to shift in 48 hours from all in-person instruction delivery to exclusively remote instruction delivery. And that's just what's on the surface. Beneath the surface is everything else that goes on in a child's life and that usually happens in a school, from providing nutrition to safe places to learn to all the technology that is required to do that remote instruction. But at its heart was this major shift with zero time to prepare to delivering all of the instruction to each child in their own home instead of in a classroom where they're all together. You know, Millie, you've been an educator, you've been a school administrator and an elected official who worked on education legislation. I'd be interested in your insight um, on this, given that background. Well, uh, this whole COVID-19 situation has turned uh, education completely upside down. Um, we have students and teachers who were thriving one day um, by coming to school and working together, establishing close relationships and a learning environment to um, overnight being um, working from home and having to uh, figure out a long distance um, uh, internet-based relationships using technology. And uh, many students and teachers were really not that comfortable using that form of communication. Um, and imagine the role of a principal shifting from supporting teachers and learners in a school to suddenly being the person responsible for delivering breakfasts and lunches to kids and families who might otherwise not have enough to eat. Uh, one of the districts with whom Keystone is working right now, um, our key contact there shifted from a leader focusing on um, reimagining the schools for the future. Overnight, his role shifted to the person responsible for delivering um, electronic devices to homes and families where students did not have access. So th those kinds of, um, that kind of upheaval has just really gone through the entire system of education from students to teachers to parents um, who were thrust not only into the role suddenly of working from home but also educating their children and supporting their children's education um, from home. You know, Merrick, we're actually we're about two months into this now. Um, we are seeing school districts across the country trying to figure out how to deliver instruction. So can you actually go and, and give some insight on that, on how our uh, administrators and teachers delivering instruction now. Sure, and you know, I think there's the technical side of how are those teachers delivering those in, that instruction. Then you get in into a lot more of the, the, the social emotional things and what's going on behind the scenes. At its most basic level, teachers are having to use platforms that historically had been backups or they've been secondary means or simple means of, of for communicating extra information. Everything from Google Hangouts to Zoom conferences or the different applications that different school district uses, things like Campus Connect, platforms where once they would post homework or they'd be able to share a message have now become the primary means for teachers communicating with their students. And whether that's a Zoom classroom or a Google Hangout or something like that where they can deliver the instruction as though they were in front of the students and the students can ask them questions or using different means to post homework and to receive homework and to grade it. So they've had to shift entirely to delivering it virtually or remotely like that. Um, at the same time, they're dealing with their own realities, whether it's the different situations the kids have at home. I, I think one of the biggest things this has highlighted is the inequities. It's very easy to say, well, let's just get every kid online. Mm -hmm. Depending on the school district, we see districts where anywhere from 15 to upwards of 25 to 28 percent of students don't have access to a device and a broadband internet. It's easy for the family that maybe has four bedrooms to put each of their kids in a different bedroom with a device. But the reality is we also have families with a single family, with a single bedroom in the home, two parents working from home and, and a couple of kids trying to do their homework. 
And let's not forget about the teachers. The teachers are not living in their own isolation either. They're at home with a spouse, with roommates, with their own kids, trying to find the space for them to be able to deliver the instruction to students across the district, all living in very different conditions themselves. So teachers have really become monumental heroes. Not only are they finding ways to do this, you're seeing stories of teachers doing parades through neighborhoods so the kids can see them and connect with them. But teachers are dealing with some very real challenges in their own homes with the students. We've got districts where upwards of 20% of students have never logged on. And the teacher who once was able to look at that child in their classroom to connect with them is struggling and trying to figure out how they connect with them now. And then we're having to make all of the adjustments in this world where every child is thrown into such uncertainty. How do we ensure they're still learning? How do we deal with the additional pressures or stresses of things like standardized assessments? A lot of states have given those a, a pause right now, but we're gonna have to revisit things like that. So the teachers fundamentally are delivering the instruction remotely, but there is so much more going on in the teacher's lives and in every student's life that we really have to figure out how we're gonna get a lot better at all of this. You know, Millie, as a, as a parent myself, kids that are school age, we've really kind of turned the concept of parental engagement on its head. Um, I think most people thought that uh, parental engagement in their kids' education was helping with the school fundraiser or help putting together activities, but um, actual engagement in their child's education is, is something that is a lot more than just that. So I'd be curious on your thoughts on kind of how we kind of had to redefine what actual parental engagement in your child's education means. We've always known that parent involvement is critical to a child's education. Um, teachers only see students for a very small portion of any given day. And when we look at the number of hours and days students are in school, it's really very small given uh, the amount of time children are with their families and in their communities. So this whole situation has highlighted the significance of involving parents in their child's education in a real and meaningful way. Um, teachers can only do so much. Uh, certainly there are things, there are, there's professional development and uh, training and support that teachers need in order to um, do an even better job with online instruction for remediation, enrichment, or for first instruction. But it's those parents who now see themselves as uh, the key instructional leader for their children and they don't have the in many cases they don't have the skills the training or the tools in order to be able to really help their children in a meaningful way so I think um, that they're struggling and they need support and they need ideas for um, how to do an even better job with their children at home. Along those lines Barry, what, what have been some of the aha moments that we've had uh, in this sure. situation? Yeah, you know, I, I think just to start with where Millie was speaking, I think it is what is the role of, of parents. We've asked parents to make sure their kids are doing their homework. We've asked parents in the past to be part of school fundraisers or school events or the PTA. One of the aha moments is we need to engage parents in a wholly different way to actually be involved in the education side of it. But I think beyond that, some of the aha moments, number one, teachers are ready to adapt and ready to step up and do whatever we ask of them. They are so eager and committed to doing what it takes, but we haven't supported them the way we need to. We've thrown around words like remote instruction or blended learning or the flipped classroom, but in so many cases, it's been lip service. When we look at what are we teaching teachers when they're in their early preparation, when they're going through teacher training, what are we providing for them in early career supports or in ongoing professional development, and how connected is it to these other things that we're asking them to doing? And frankly, we failed them. We have fallen short and we owe them better and we owe kids better. They need to be supported in how to fully utilize all these additional tools. But I think the other big aha moments are that there are a lot of tools and innovations that teachers are coming up with now or that we had kind of sitting on the back burner that now we need to critically deploy. We need to upscale them, we need to provide teachers and parents and school leaders and system leaders with the necessary training and development, uh, professional development with all of those tools, because we have the means to do this. It's just going to mean fundamentally rethinking how we deliver this instruction. I think one of the other big aha moments is at that nexus of how we deliver instruction and how we support teachers 
And that is, what is the role of teacher? Historically, it's been to manage a classroom and deliver instruction and differentiate it based on the kids in front of them and how they were responding. And it may be as we head for what are likely future periods of system interruption like this, that we need to rethink how the role of teacher is structured and how they interact with students and really seize on a lot of these things like competency-based education and how we use blended learning. We've seen people talk about taking instruction online or remote, and it's pretty straightforward to do that if all you're offering is the synchronous delivery of instruction. Six hours of reading at a video screen, what you would have otherwise read in front of a classroom of students. But there is so much more that we can be doing to meet the different needs of every student. Let's just uh, finish on one last question here. Emil, I'll start with you, and Barrick, you alluded to this uh, already, but so we are fairly confident that there will be future disruptions, right? COVID-19 is, is a unique historic pandemic, but you know, what are we doing now, or what can be done to help make school districts more resilient to any, from, uh, any similar situations like this in the future? Uh, Emil, I'll start with you, then Barrick, I'll have you uh, follow up on that. The school leaders are already planning right now for what the fall might look like. Um, they're, plan they're having conversations about will school resume as it usually does? Will schools continue to be closed? Or will there be some kind of hybrid education program where some small groups of children can come in one day and maybe alternate uh, throughout the day? So um, these conversations are going on. We hear superintendents um, refer to the silver lining as we work through the challenges um, and some successes that schools and school districts are facing with COVID-19. And there are some opportunities for us to deeply listen to our parents, our students, our teachers, our, sc our school communities um, about how they have thrived uh, through this very challenging situation? And are there some lessons we can capture and learn? Uh, one of the issues that has been really highlighted um, has to do with the inequities in our education system. We have children in Colorado and throughout the nation who are living in rural parts of the state with very little access to any technology, without broadband, without Wi-Fi, without cell service. And how can we capitalize on some of the challenges that have been brought to the forefront um, and work through these together? And I think through listening and learning um, and working together, we can come up with some real solutions for our schools to not only help them through this crisis, but to make them stronger as a result of this crisis. Barrick? I agree with everything Millie said. And you know, I, I hear some people talk about, when will we get back to normal? And my hope and my commitment is, we never get back to what was. We owe our students, we owe our families, we owe our teachers so much more than that. We put a man on the moon. We turned wires into a means of global commerce and global communication with the internet. We have overcome and built better out of every challenge that has ever been thrown at this country. And I think this is our opportunity to do so when it comes to education. I see so many people from inside and outside education, whether it's technology executives or community organization leaders, mental health experts, nutritional experts, so many people want to come together and help. And as we were talking earlier, all of the innovations we've seen sitting on the sidelines that can now help. My hope and my commitment, and Millie and I are working together right now with folks to make sure we never get back to what was accepted as the norm, that we take this opportunity to bring all of those voices together, from the teachers to the system leaders to the experts in every field, and make sure we harness every bit of American ingenuity and every commitment we have to our kids to make sure that when we go back to school this fall, it's a better experience, not what was, and that we move forward to what's possible, not to what was the status quo or the norm before. And we're going to do that, as Millie said, by listening, by understanding, and by pushing people's thinking to believe in something better that tears down those inequities and uses every bit of innovation to deliver 
a fundamentally stronger form of education that supports our teachers and our kids much better. All right. Well said. Thank you both. I appreciate it very much.